Researcher M.A. Slangen was among the authors of the UN's 2021 climate change report. Its projections for sea level changes were a wake-up call for governments and scientists. I guess that was my real realization, like, oh wow, this is very, yeah, this is really bad. Slangen is a climatologist who works at the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research. So does Teert Boma, an expert in the dynamics of coastal ecosystems, who's devised a wave simulator to help improve the country's sea defenses. Adjusting the country to keep it safe on the long term, we are now at the stage that we need to learn how to defend our coast. Their colleague Klaus Timmermans is also committed to stemming rising sea levels. And when it comes to reducing our carbon footprint, seaweed, he says, could be a game changer. Coastal ecologist Tiert Boma specializes in reinforcing levees or dikes and says there are still valuable lessons to be learned today from the North Sea flood of 1953. The devastation back then was more limited in places covered with a marsh grass. It effectively absorbs energy from incoming waves and dampens their impact, making cord grass of acute interest to researchers. Here you see a picture of uh, here you have the sea area and this is the polder which is now being flooded and what you can see here is the green area is a salt marsh and here there was no salt marsh in front of the dike and you see the flood resulted in two breaches here of differing sizes this fragile looking marsh grass has been shown to provide protection against floods which due to global warming are set to increase in both frequency and intensity. If you live in a low-laying country like the Netherlands, you will never be able to live there without dikes. Uh, but with sea level rise and accelerating sea level rise, the maintenance and construction of dikes will get increasingly more expensive. And to be able uh, to keep up with the sea level rise, uh, to keep our flood safety standards uh, to keep those up with sea level rise. Nature can help us a lot, uh, but we should not be dreaming and say, well, we can forget about the, the engineering, but we have to make smart use of nature in combination with engineering. And you can really see that uh, the growing awareness uh, of the problems with sea level rise also leads to a growing awareness that uh, there is uh, a need for a transition in how we cope with uh, flood safety. And so there is a growing willingness to, to think about alternative solutions in which nature plays an important role. BOMA uses this wave machine to illustrate the principle to doctoral researchers. Of marshes, uh, that, uh, Levees without cord grass erode so, faster. This is the position and, uh, well, I was trained as an ecologist, but I always uh, worked as a kid already on uh, motorcycles and all kinds of technical stuff. Um, so I like to play with uh, stuff. And we were very happy at the point when we uh, were designing these that we had a uh, technician that came from industry and he was really good in pneumatics. So uh, we were discussing how do we get something that makes waves and is cheap because we don't want one perfect wave machine, we want to have multiple so that we can have replications as uh, variability is so important in ecology. So what you see is you get the big wave hitting there and then the wave goes back and reflects it several times. And by the asymmetric movement of the, the wave pedal, we get a really realistic irregular wave. And that's the magic in these boxes. The scientist firmly believes that cord grass is a viable solution for coastal protection.
The challenge now is how to plant the grass in mudflats without it being washed away by the North Sea tides. It may be hard to imagine it, now it's completely dry and the water is far away, but uh, in three hours uh, from now it will be completely flooded again, and three hours before it was also flooded. Boma and his team have developed an inventive and environmentally friendly construction for the purpose. A lattice structure made of potato starch. So this will help us to widen the marsh and thereby exactly. get a yeah, so better flood defense. This is a clear test that uh, if we can support the growth of the seedlings early in their life mm -hmm. cycle by securing their root zone, and we can allow the mature plants to grow much deeper in the tidal frame, which means that the marsh can expand and be longer and have a more protective benefit for our dikes. Meanwhile, on the global scale, there's a growing urgency to enhance coastal defenses and at the same time slow down climate change. And seaweed could make a notable contribution here. Among its champions is ecophysiologist Klaus Timmermans. He sees seaweed as an excellent meat substitute, and it comes with a big advantage. Unlike in the meat production industry, the plants emit zero carbon dioxide. On the contrary, this is really the basis of the food chain. So, so uh, or, organisms like this, they use solar lights, CO2, uh, and form biomass. So it's, it's the most simple way of forming biomass. Uh, they're, they're really on their own. They don't it's need a, anything good. else than that. So it's the most efficient way to produce food. These plants, they grow in salt water. There's plenty of uh, salt water. There's nowadays a shortage of fresh water in many areas. Um, and, uh, well, this, this, uh, this biomass has many characteristics that make it very suitable also to use it as food for humans. The problem here is that global warming poses a threat to all organic life, including seaweed. Well, there are a lot of seaweed forests in the ocean, and with uh, global warming, some of them just uh, disappeared. So I want to know the reason that they disappeared and how much they can disappear to the polar oil. Reducing CO2 levels is key to putting the brakes on global warming. Politically, insisting that people abandon meat in favor of seaweed is hardly a feasible idea at the moment, as the scientists from the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research themselves know. The generation and transportation of animal products is an area with scope for reducing greenhouse gases. And here too, there is a pioneering project in the Netherlands, a floating farm in the city of Rotterdam. Hendrik Kampen supplements the feed for the resident cows with surplus food from supermarkets, carrots, apples, and other unsold produce. Another contribution to carbon footprint reduction. The waterborne farm is based on the concept of maximum sustainability through recycling. The manure robot is uh, gathering all the manure which is inside the stable, and then it will bring it to one point. And from that point, we separate it in wet and dry parts. And uh, with the dry parts, we make small pellets which you can use as a fertilizer in gardens, uh, for example. And the urine, yeah, we process it actually, and then we make clean water of it. Yeah, it's quite high tech, it's new. It's also our invention, um, had to do it like that. And then we can put it back into the harbor. All the water from the roof is collected and it's, it's going here with those pipes here, it's going down, it goes to our cellar. There we have a system which cleans actually the rainwater, so it gets some dust and other parts out. And then from there we pump it up again 
and we pump it uh, to, the, to the water uh, reservoirs actually for the cows. The floating farm with 37 cows on board supplies dairy products for 2,000 residents in the immediate vicinity. So this milk does not have a sizable carbon footprint from being transported all the way from the countryside to the city. The cheeses are stored below the water level in a naturally cool space, which again helps to reduce the farm's carbon emissions. The project has been making headlines far beyond the Netherlands' borders. Dubai is interested. Floating farms could become a unique Dutch export product. But are they really the future? It's a scenario that the country is already preparing for. Conventional farming in coastal areas is at particularly high risk from climate change and rising sea levels. Despite the extensive network of levees, water from the North Sea seeps into the groundwater. Farmer Wim van Horsel finds himself fighting a battle on multiple fronts. We get drought periods. Of the last five years, four were dry. And that's bad for our products. But then you sometimes get severe downpours with a lot of water in a very short time. And that means having to pump it out. The resulting deficit in farm production, says Klaas Timmermans, could be partly compensated by a whole new kind of sea food. Back in the lab at the Sea Research Institute, he and a doctoral researcher are looking at ways of extracting proteins from seaweed. The aim is to create supplements in other food products. If you want to extract larger quantities, then you need a biorefinery procedure in order to break open the biomass so that proteins can be extracted. And while well, it sounds very easy, how hard can it be? But in practice, it turns out to be quite complicated. And we are trying new techniques now, for example, using enzymes from marine fungi that can break open the biomass so that the proteins can be released and be uh, concentrated. Together with his team, he's examining the reproduction cycle of seaweed. After dying, it regenerates through the fusion of female and male units called spores. The science of growing seaweed is still in its infancy. We can actually bring those together um, in specific crosses. So there are males and females, and we can cross those. Um, and then we can actually cross, for instance, material from here in Zeeland um, with material from Norway um, to see what effect that has on, um, on the, on the, yeah, how, how the kelp actually looks like. So maybe they grow way bigger, so a farmer has better yields. Um, maybe they have higher protein contents or higher sugar contents, for instance, for the bioethanol industry. So um, we actually want to breed for yeah, specific industry um, uses. The scientists want to increase the harvests of marine farmers, like Joost Wouters. While the seaweed sector is far more advanced in Asia, he sees massive potential for Europe too. His farm in the village of Kamperland, in the coastal Zeeland region, supplies seaweed to the Dutch food industry. Right now, uh since there is no seaweed in the harvesters behind us, all kind of other biomass is growing on the lines. So we need to clean them because the lines become too heavy and they take away all the light and all the nutrients of the, of the seaweed. I think when people began farming hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, they also run into things that they find out and, and optimize over time. And we are not there yet, so we need to, um, uh, yeah, we need to invent a lot of things. We're still, everyone who's walking in seaweed is still kind of pioneer. There's a lot of things possible with seaweed for human and animal health, to regenerate soils, to 
uh, make materials like plastic. So there's a lot of applications with seaweed. Now, what we see over the last years is that the demand for seaweed is growing enormously. Because seaweed doesn't need land, it doesn't need fertilizers, and it doesn't need fresh water. As you can see, it grows just outside. It needs sunlight, it needs CO2, uh, and it needs uh, the marine nutrients that are in the water. That's all. So the seaweed doesn't need any other resource. That is Zeesla, as a green beer. That's here time. Donald de Schacht from Belgium is a chef and a self-styled ambassador of algae. He hosts classes aimed at breaking down people's aversion to the feel and smell of seaweed. He showcases the plant as a refreshing ingredient in a gin and tonic or a healthy salad. I hope uh, one year uh, every kitchen, every store uh, have fresh seaweed. Uh, seaweed uh, powder is very good for every, everybody, especially this one. With this, uh, we have a red wheat, uh, dulce, we call it, um, when you fry it in a hot te temperature. Then it tastes like um, bacon, you know? Omelette with bacon, without bacon. It's a future food. <laughs> Seaweed can be added to everything from pasta and bread to burgers. Another aim of the chef-turned-food innovator is to unlock participants' creative potential. Tiered Boma has made a trip down to the sea for a field experiment. It's a big day for the team from the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research as they prepare to launch his custom-made wave simulator. It was designed by the coastal ecologist together with engineers and is one of a kind. The mobile machine has its own name, the Moby Wave. Tom, you can get out of the way. Please get out of the way. If you think about safety, then... Also, cameraman, uh, be careful. <laughs> go, go to the side for safety. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Okay. <laughs> What went wrong there? But I'm happy but, you were uh, not standing behind it. Helping to get off the, wheels. the problem was not the wave machine itself, but the winch. But there are no casualties, and the Moby Wave is also unscathed. The team now pushed the contraption to the edge of a small patch of cord grass before lowering it into the water. In the days to come, it will help them to study the delicate sea plant's properties. Amy Slangen's daily commute to the Institute takes her along one of the many dikes lining the Dutch coast. The Netherlands is a global frontrunner in coastal protection management. But the scientist warns against being lulled into a false sense of security. For the Netherlands, sea level change, I guess, is one of the biggest consequences of climate change, uh, or at least one of the, the biggest things we're watching out for, because a lot a big part of the country is below sea level. And we have these huge dikes, like the ones we're cycling on now, that protect us. Uh, this area would be flooded otherwise. And with sea level rise, the risks of flood are increasing. So a uh, water height that we now see only once in a century, by the end of this century, <laughs> we will see that same water height approximately every two to 10 years. So all of these water heights are, are increasing. We will see those much more often. The 
climatologist has analyzed a range of studies on global warming and its consequences and concluded that sea levels are likely to rise 25 centimeters by the middle of the century. And that already disturbing estimate is merely the average figure. So in the Netherlands, we are in a pretty privileged position. We have money and technologies to help us prepare against sea level rise. Um, even though we are a low-lying country, we have a very high protection level, probably the highest in the world uh, for our coastline. But of course, there's other nations that are less rich and have less options to defend their coasts. Um, and on top of that, uh, sea level rise is not the same everywhere. There's big regional differences. So if it's 25 centimeters um, on a global average, there's around the equator, it's typically higher than 25 centimeters, so they might get 30 centimeters already. And then if you're in a country like Bangladesh, which is really low, really poor, and doesn't have any protection against sea level rise, they, they are more in trouble. And actually, they're paying the price for the, the development we've already had in the Western world. Slangen lives near the Institute for Sea Research, but wants her address to remain undisclosed. She now chooses to publish her insights only rarely on social media, to avoid the hate messages and worse that she and her fellow researchers have been subjected to. Colleagues of mine have gotten threats. Uh, lots of, of more famous climate change scientists, uh, they, they actually get threats and there's even um, some in the United States, for instance, that have gotten death threats. Um, so really quite severe, uh, so the real public figures. Um, but in my case, it was more like, oh, you're lying, you're selling shit. it's all not true. It's all, yeah, uh, a bunch of lies you're telling. But there are now projects on the ground, or rather, in the water, that have heeded the projections of climate scientists. This little neighborhood in Amsterdam was born in 2008, years before the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recommended building homes on the water. It's a concept with a twofold advantage. There's no disruption to nature. Plus, rising water levels are less of an issue for floating settlements. The Volkenir family used to live in a regular apartment in a typical densely populated and concrete-clad urban neighborhood. It all started with one person, Mian de Blok. She is a friend of us, and she had a dream of living in a sustainable, off the grid, floating neighborhood. And uh, then, with a group of friends, we went to the local authorities of Amsterdam. We asked, "Can we build somewhere in the water this uh, our dream?" And everybody built his own house, like. I'm an architect, so for me it was a double dream. So it was a dream to live in a group of friends and uh, in our own initiated project, but also to design within the project our own house. The neighborhood is now home to over 140 people and generates a significantly lower carbon footprint than conventional housing. We have like electricity panels on top uh, we have like a smart grid system where we have, uh, where we took all together, we collect the electricity and, div and we divide it for every household. We have heating panels for heating the water. It's also uh, done by the sun. And we uh, uh, recollect nutrition out of the poop and pee. We, so we have a black water uh, system that all our black water goes into a biogas station. Back at the field experiment headed by Tiered Boma, the team is now taking the opportunity during low tide to set up a tank for testing the wave machine. The walls need to be firmly anchored due to the enormous forces the simulator will be subjected to by the tides. 
Hop. Hey. Next. And with high tide due in just a couple of hours, there's no time to lose. So again, one with the metal and a rope. The water arrives, quietly but steadily. The Moby Wave team managed to get set up in time. They've also attached sensors to the test tank, which are connected with their computer, enabling them to gather data for an entire week. It's now time to turn on the machine. The simulated waves in the test tank will provide the researchers with insights into the impact of the waves on the cord grass. When you then want to use uh, uh, salt marshes for coastal defense, you also need to know how far uh, they can grow. And uh, well, one of the mechanisms that they can uh, uh, retreat again is due to cliff formation. So when you might get erosion on the tidal flat, because it's very vulnerable to erosion, the salt might stay stable, you can get the height difference. And when this height difference becomes too big, you, you get a cliff that will stay there for a long time, and the cliff erodes backwards. So if you want to, uh, well, if you want to really be able to use salt marshes for coastal defense, you need to also know exactly under which conditions, well, these kind of bad uh, processes uh, may happen. Sea levels are rising as the climate continues to heat up, with temperatures already a full degree Celsius higher than in the pre-industrial era. A further increase of two or three degrees would see extreme weather conditions becoming increasingly fierce and frequent, a potential problem even for the world's leading sea defense system. I think the Dutch Delta is one of the best defended deltas in the world. So uh, if we talk about today and the, the coming uh, 20, 30 years, there's no problem. But given the long-term um, well, uh, strategies uh, of adjusting the country to keep it safe on the long term, we are now at the stage that we need to learn how to defend our coast from, uh, let's say, well, uh, 2050 to 2100. If we would wait till then to do this kind of research, well, then there is no time left to adjust uh, the system. Because we look at the nature-based defense uh, and creating a marsh in front of a dike to help defend the dike, that will take time. Because the plants have to trap the sediment uh, and it has to grow with the sea level. And that's, that's a, a slow process. So you have to start early enough with the knowledge development.